Good evening. It is so good to hear all the fellowship going on out there. It's so good to see some new faces back with us again. Uh, I won't mention any names, but his initials are Sam. It's so good to see him back again. But uh, after a long, long stay. In your chorus book, we're going to start out with number 41. Uh, Glory, hallelujah, Christ has set me free. And if you sing really good, I'll let you stay seated. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah, Christ has set me free. Given. I'm on my way to heaven to live eternally. Glory, hallelujah. He's coming soon for me. How many was that a new chorus to? I thought so. Let's do it again. It's a good little chorus. We'll do it again and uh, uh, put that in your memory bank. Here we go. Glory, hallelujah, Christ has set me free. Glory, hallelujah, a new life now I see. My sins are all forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven to live eternal. Turn the page over to number 45. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. <clears throat> gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally, praise God, my sins are gone. Now, I didn't hear the men going, gee, oh, any gone. We got to do that on that last gone. Let's do it again. Here we go. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea, yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally, praise God, my sins are gone. All right, and then uh, uh, right across the page, number 48, he holds my hand. He holds my hand, Jesus holds my hand, safely to heaven he leads the way, he is my keeper from day to day, he holds my hand. road may be long, but my Savior is strong, and he holds my hand. Well, if the song leader would pay attention to the words instead of singing what he remembers, let's do that again. We'll try to do it right this time. Here we go. He holds my hand. Jesus Jesus holds my hand, safely to heaven he leads the way, he is my keeper from day to day, he holds my hand, Jesus holds my hand, the road may be long, but my 
Savior is strong and he holds my hand. And then turn the page over to number 53. One door and only one, and yet their Amen. sides are two. <clears throat> One door and only one, and yet their sides are two. Inside and outside, on which side are you? One door and only one, and yet their sides are two. I'm on the inside, on which side are you? Again, one door and only one, and yet their sides are two. Inside and outside, on which side are you? One door and only one, and yet the sides are two. I'm on the inside, on which side are you? And then the top of the next page, number 54, he is able. <laughs> He, he is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He is able, he is able, I know he is able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. the broken hearted and set the captive free he made the lame to walk again and he caused the blind to see he is able he is able i know he is able i know my lord is able to carry me down on the bottom of the page 56 his name is wonderful <coughs> his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful Jesus my Lord he Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. To the glory of God the Father. Good to have each one of you here for service tonight. If you're joining us through live stream, we'd like to welcome you as well. And if you're looking for a home church, we pray that you'll consider independent. It is good to see some familiar faces back from up north, uh, Bill and Sandy. And uh, you're the first of our snowbirds to return. And um, then uh, we have some other faces that are familiar. I've only seen you on uh, Facebook, brother. And uh, so we have the privilege this evening of having uh, Keith Carringer and his wife Bethany with us. He's been voted in as pastor down at Bethel. And so he's a answer to prayer, both you and your family. And I assume this is some of the rest of your family that is here with you tonight. And so praise God. We're we're, uh, we're thanking the Lord for the little ones and the, the uh, adults. That's such a blessing. Praise God. Thank you for coming tonight. And I'm really looking forward. Um, on the heels of that, I'll make this announcement. And um, I'm thankful that God is answering our prayers. I want to be encouragement to Brother Keith this evening 
And so we don't normally take up an offering on Wednesday night. Whatever's given goes toward benevolence. This evening, um, I'd like to take up an offering. And on the way out, if you would just drop it in. Um, anything that is not already designated um, will go to uh, Brother Keith and his family to be a blessing to them. And if you want to make sure, you can put it in an envelope and just say, uh, Pastor Keith, that would be a good thing to put, okay? And so drop that in on the way out, and we can be a blessing to them and their family. Um, I'm so thankful that they're here. Looking forward to working with them. I do want to make a couple other announcements about this coming week. Um, Friday, we're having a memorial service for Maria Valdez. And she, we're, we're honoring her in memorial at Stevenson Nelson Funeral Home on Friday the 8th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. is the viewing. 12 p.m. is the memorial service. Um, so if you want to come for the service and just come a couple minutes early or come some early. Uh, she loved flowers, so if you send flowers, that would be fine. Um, I, it was requested that you wear uh, yellow and purple. Those were her favorite colors. And so it's a celebration of life. Uh, if you know Maria, her favorite phrase was, thank God, right? And I already know where I'm going to take my sermon from in the scripture. You know, God has been so good um, as we say goodbye and we remember these who have passed this year. Uh, their lives were so marked by just the hand of God. And uh, probably a lot of people already know what I'm going to say at her funeral. So her, her memorial service is this Friday. Um, viewing from 10 to 12, memorial service at 12, burial to follow at Lakeview Memorial Gardens. And the memorial service will be at Stevenson Nelson Funeral Home on the Parkway. Uh, the next announcement I have is regarding this coming Sunday night. Sunday night we will be having a memorial service for Gordon Armstrong. And um, in place of the evening service, I, there's no place that Gordon would rather be on a Sunday night than church, right? And so I said, why not just have it during a church service? Um, his family and friends will be here. And uh, so we're going to honor Gordon and honor the Lord this coming Sunday evening at 6 p.m. And um, come prepared for that. We'll probably have an opportunity for folks to share. Gordon touched so many lives during his life. And the Lord left him around for a long time, blessed us with him, and then took him home. So um, just be in prayer for that service. Continue to pray for Melinda. And I'm so glad she's here with us tonight. She has a praise she'll share later. Um, and then looking forward this month, uh, we will plan to have a service for Betty Stamper. Um, when Brother Bob returns from up north, continue to pray for him um, as he's in this just mourning and yet remembering. Um, he's going to be traveling north to Pennsylvania here in the next couple days. So we'll pray for your safety, brother. Uh, we'll plan to have a service for Miss Betty on Saturday the 23rd. That will be in the bulletin, but I'm just, you know, putting that out there ahead of time. And then if you did not already pick up a copy of our flyer for the missions conference, uh, be sure to pick up one of those. It has the pictures of our missionaries in it. And so it's one of these right here. Pick one up for family for right now. I gave one to most of the people. And uh, pray over it, be in prayer for our missions conference that's coming up the end of this month. And uh, we're excited about it. Uh, looking forward to that. I've got a couple praises and prayer requests. I'll save those for the next couple minutes. So let's go ahead and sing together again. One more song in your chorus book, number uh, 52. Number 52, Into My Heart. We'll stand and we'll sing this through twice. <clears throat> Into my heart Into my heart Come into my heart Lord Jesus Come in today Come in to stay
I'm enjoying learning some new choruses, learning some new songs on Wednesday night. So I want to thank Brother Dave for that. Let's go ahead and take out our prayer sheet this evening. Um, this starts a new month, and can't believe it's already October. I said that once already. You'll probably hear it again. We have new prayer sheets in the foyer. Um, if you'll raise your hand, um, could we have those brought down the aisle maybe? Um, there's a stack of them maybe. Yeah, just grab that stack and bring it down, please. Thank you. I should have instructed that. Keep your hand raised. We do have prayer requests. We also have some answers to prayer. <laughs> you telling them to share? <laughs> Save paper. Save a tree. <laughs> I have a praise I'd like to share. Um, I was able to speak with my dad today and um, got a phone call from the hospital. I thought it was him. I called back, spoke to my dad. He's, um, he's doing better, had a good conversation. And uh, thank you for your many prayers. Um, and after I talked with him, <coughs> he, he said that he, he'd slept well, but he's, he asked for prayer from the church. I said, do you have any prayer requests from the church? And he says, yes. He said um, he, he's praying that God would give him an area of ministry. And so he says, pray that God would direct me. I want to be able to minister to people. And um, he's not been discharged from the hospital yet. And so that's, that's really good. That's a good thing to see. So pray for him if you would. Um, we're planning a conference call with his doctor tomorrow at 10 a.m. And hopefully might be discharged Friday. And so just pray for us. There's a lot of things that have to happen between now and then. And um, so what we really need is God's grace. So please pray for that. Uh, the Burgers, I took, talked with them today. They're still recovering from COVID, but they're doing well. Um, Mike was home from the hospital. Ledbetters, we've been praying for them. They're, they're recovering. Um, and then I have some prayer requests regarding folks in the church. Um, Miss Carolyn actually asked for prayer for her grandson, Wyatt, 15-year-old um, young man, um, facing some surgeries in the upcoming future. And he's going to have to have a surgery on his back that will be pretty entailed. Um, it's gonna, he'll be compromised for a little while before he can recover from that. Um, then he'll need, he'll need surgery on his feet one at a time, and each surgery is going to take approximately eight weeks to recover from, from the beginning until he has therapy and that's done. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And the uh, MRI and the contrast thing. That doctor said there is not a tumor on his back disc. And I, I don't really know what it is or how to explain it. All I know is they said no surgery on the back. He would be in a back brace for like, I, I, I want to think she said 16 weeks or something, except for when he was in the shower. Okay. Okay. Continue to be in prayer for Wyatt regarding that. Uh, they're still finding out the condition of his back. They thought it was a tumor. It's something else, and so he'll he'll have to have a back brace for an extended period of time, and then have surgery on his feet. So thank you. Do be in prayer for him. Um, also continue to pray for Gloria and Wayne Mott. Um, her condition is um, deteriorating, and it's, it's hard for Brother Wayne right now taking care of her and taking care of everything around the house. Really, he's, he needs your prayers for strength. Um, her sister, I think her name is Julie, is going to be coming in town tomorrow. Uh, so let's pray that they have a good restful night tonight. Night seems to be a difficult time for them, and those of you who have gone for extended periods of time without sleep and then have to, to care for someone, it's very hard. And um, so think about that and allow that to drive your prayers when you pray for him. Uh, pray for Miss Gloria, that God would release her from any pain 
and would give her sister safety as she's on her way. So pray for Gloria and Wayne Mott. Um, also continue to pray for um, Mr. Valentin Valdez, Uncle Val, we call him. Um, his wife passed away, and so he's mourning the, life of the, the, the loss of his wife. Continue to pray for Brother Bob Stamper, and he's in service, but um, still just thinking through those things and mourning as is appropriate. We sorrow, just not as those without hope, and so we still sorrow. Pray for Brother Bob. Continue to pray for Simone Fielder, dealing with the passing of Bob, and with moving, going through moving at this time, very stressful. And um, so pray for her. Continue to pray for Bill Dunsford and Marcy Graham as they bills on hospice, and Miss Marcy has recently been moved to hospice. Bill's on hospice. Um, Unless that happened today. Okay. I may be wrong. Today. Okay, I guess he's okay. She said he's not on hospice. All right, I might be incorrect. Bill's not doing well though. Keep him in prayer. All right. Anybody else? Other prayer requests to mention, update, or praises? We allow those too. Brother Herman. How about if we continue to pray for Myanmar and Afghanistan? We can do that. Continue to pray for Myanmar, civil unrest there in Afghanistan um, with the recent takeover by the Taliban. All right, continue to pray for them. Yes, Miss Debbie. I had something cute happen. A lot of you know my grandson, Jacob, that's eight years old and he's very outspoken. And uh, so I took him into CVS to get some socks for the homeless because that's on our bulletin. And we were up there paying for it, and he grabs a bulletin out of my hand and gives it to the lady and says, you need to go to church. We have a really good church, and it's really, really fun. And he uh, <laughs> said, I know the address is on there. So he looked through it, and he found the address, and he said, you get a pen, and you write, go to church right here. <laughs> so I thought, out of the mouths of babes. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cute. Jacob is pretty assertive. He's very assertive. That's wonderful. Yeah. So Miss Debbie gave a testimony, if you're watching her grandson. She was in, uh, in the store buying some things for the Speak Love ministry, and he took the bulletin out of her hand and invited the, the clerk to church. So praise God. Um, we'll just bring him with us, and he can do that. No, that's fantastic. Miss Donna? Uh, yes. Uh, my neighbor, Karen Ellis, that is a snowbird that lives behind me. Um, her daughter is expecting a baby next week, and they have discovered that there are some poss possible major problems with the baby. Hmm. Uh, Be in prayer for Miss Donna's neighbor, Karen. She has a daughter. Her name is Laura, and this daughter is expecting a child. Um, evidently, she contracted a virus at some point, and it's affected the development of her unborn baby. So pray for that whole situation for Karen, for Laura, and for the unborn baby. Thank you, Miss Donna. Yes, wife, Jennifer. God. Amen. So she was sharing, my wife was sharing that one of the students had to withdraw to, due to health reasons, um, which is discouraging because we're going to miss the guy um, and his family, but that the Lord had provided another student, filled right in, and he's coming tomorrow. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, Melinda. Uh, I've got a couple of praises. One, I've been having a trouble with my refrigerator leaking. This was even before Dad passed. And uh, the Lord provided me one by someone here in the church that needed to get rid of one. So I, uh, our wonderful traveling pastor fixed it all day and showed up at my doorstep, him and his son with it yesterday. And they took out my old one and I said, man, this one doesn't have a ice maker, does it? He says, no, it doesn't. 
Praise God. Melinda had a couple issues that we were praying about. One was a refrigerator that I'd wrestled with in the past and couldn't fix it, and the Lord replaced it, and uh, it was free. Something so praise he God. Fix. He yeah. Didn't fix. yeah. And then um, she had a dialysis port needed taking at, taken out, and the original uh, doctor they they had some complications and couldn't do it, and her doctor said we'll do it today. So praise God for that. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. If you would bow with me, keep these. Yes, ma'am, one more. Sherry Johnston. Yes, thank I you. Today. Okay. And uh, she said that thank everyone for their prayers. She's doing wonderful as well. She hasn't had one pain since she's had her surgery. And she said, you can call me John, I'm just sitting here with my leg. <laughs> so Sharon Johnston, when they were getting ready to come south, their snowbirds live up. They're friends with the Johnsons. If that's not confusing, then say it again. And um, they, they, sh they were getting ready to come south, and she fell and broke her ankle. Oh, and, um, and so we've been praying for her, and she told Miss Judy to thank the church for your prayers because she has not had one ounce of pain. God has been taking care of her. So thank the Lord for that, and Lord willing, we'll see them soon. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and worship together. Lord, I pray that you would just be with these uh, prayer requests that were mentioned tonight. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful about taking these before your throne. We thank you for the praises, for the answers to prayer. We thank you for Pastor Carringer and his family. We thank you, dear Lord, for looking out for your church. We, we thank you, dear Lord, for the healing that you've brought. I pray, dear Lord, a special just special prayer request for the Mots this evening, for Miss Gloria, for Brother Wayne. Uh, please take care of them tonight. Dear Lord, my heart goes out to them. And God, they need your help. Um, we know that, that you are the God of all the earth who loves us more than we could possibly understand. God, please pour out your grace on them tonight. These and other requests, dear Lord, I, I pray that you would answer. I think of this unborn child. Uh, Laura's unborn baby. Dear Lord, you, you're the one that knits the baby in the mother's womb. Uh, you created them. And dear Lord, that's the work that you do in secret. I pray, God, that you would bring healing, that you would help that family. Help us tonight as we study your word. Guide us, teach us, challenge us. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. Please take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 tonight. We're continuing our study in the Decalogue. That's the preface for the Levitical law. God's law for God's people. He's called them out of Egypt. He says, I'm going to call you out. I'm your God. And now I'm about to give you a law. And this law was all encompassing. It was not just moral. It was civil and it was ceremonial. It governed how they related to God, to one another, and to righteousness. And we're working our way through this law here at the beginning. Um, this is really a preface for it, just the Ten Commandments, um, Exodus chapter 20. So I'm going to begin in uh, verse 3, and we'll kind of work our way down just by way of introduction. Verse 3, he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The idea is in my face. It's not as if God is happy with you having other gods as long as He's first in order. Um, he's saying, no other gods at all. Now that the Lord was their God, they were to have none others. Polytheism was, is wrong. Not only that, but they were to worship Him not like the other gods. They worshiped other gods by making statues. You're not to worship me with other gods or like other gods. No images and no objects were, you, were to be used in representing God. Look at verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, this is not a law against taking pictures or having pictures of things, but against using them in worship. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. He has a right to be. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So God takes this seriously. Next, he says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And we use this saying that if you took the name of God, you are to live like the people of God. 
you take the name of the Lord, it shouldn't be empty. It, just not a nominal Christian. You don't just claim to be a follower of God. Those who take God's name should live godly lives. The people of God are to honor Him in their actions and in their words. In fact, he says that for the Lord will not take him, hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember, we gave the illustration that when we got married, my wife took my name. And when she took my name, at least in our uh, society, the wife takes the last name of the husband. It means something. You change your last name, and it signifies now I'm married, now I'm bound, now I'm unified with this person. My life changes, and now we two are one. And in the same vein, we two are with God. Furthermore, he moves down the line, now that God was their king, they would have a new schedule. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt. How, how many days off a week do you think slaves get? None, that's right. But now that God is their king, they would have a new schedule. Verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day. That word literally means rest, Sabbath, Shabbat, to keep it holy. Well, how should we set it apart? How do we well, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, uh, nor thy, nor thy uh, manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. How long did it take God to make everything that exists? Yeah, one solar week. That's exactly right. Six days. It says, God did it, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, we come to verse number 12, and these first laws, direct, they, they dealt directly with how man related to God. And we made the observation that many people have said the first half of the Ten Commandments, the first five are with our relationship with God, the second five are relationship with mankind. Uh, but what's interesting is this next one almost is both. Verse 12 says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Well, Pastor, how does that relate to our relationship with God? Well, very simply, it ties the first half and the second half all together. The responsibility of the parent was to prepare and train their children according to this set of laws. In fact, um, having successive generations obeying these laws hinged on the parents teaching them to their children. If there was a generation that grew up that the parents didn't teach the kids... They wouldn't know God. In fact, that happened under Joshua. Uh, Deuteronomy records something. Hold your place there in Exodus. Turn over to Deuteronomy. Notice what God says. Remember we said that the word Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. Moses preached a series of sermons applying it. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look what God said here. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's good. You memorize them. But it doesn't stop there. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he shall not depart from it. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that Christianity survives? Well, it is not the churches, it's not the schools, it is the parents. It's given to us. So he's teaching the parents, and he says, you know what, you need to train your children, but in order for the children to obey, they must honor their parents. There's got to be a relationship there. In fact, uh, the parents were the first representative of God in the home. Now, these next laws deal directly with how people were to interact with one another. And I think it's interesting that you know, in our society, anyone you meet, even if they don't believe in God, if they believe in that you evolve from, you know, pond scum, everyone has a moral compass. Everyone has some sort of morality that they follow. The problem is, without the direction from the Word of God, that moral compass is broken. It doesn't point true north. And the degree to which it does, it's because we're made in the image and likeness of God. We need God's Word to tell us these things. It cannot be trusted. What's amazing is that these commandments seem pretty cut and dried. We're going to deal with two of them tonight. Thou shalt not kill. That sounds pretty cut and dried, doesn't it? Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
two things that you and I would say are pretty important, but did you know that these are being hedged, disobeyed, ridiculed, and undermined in our society today? Under all different kinds of reasons, rationale. They're flagrantly ignored. They're downplayed. Let's look at this first one, verse 13, thou shalt not kill. That word kill there, it comes from a word that means to dash in pieces, to murder, to unlawfully kill. Uh, Many today would agree with this commandment. But the problem is, if you don't understand the basis of the commandment, why that is true, then you're going to end up at a wrong place. You'll misapply it. See, the reason why we should not kill, we should not murder, is first of all, because human life belongs to God alone. Did you know that? Psalm 24 says, "...the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for He hath founded it upon the seas." Genesis chapter 1, "...in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth." And as the Creator, He is also the owner. As Creator and owner, He alone has right to do with His creation as He so wishes. In fact, um, those who are the people of God, we belong to God twice over. So your life is not your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? When I speak to teenagers sometimes, they say, well, I can do what I want to with my body. Well, if you're a believer, it's not yours, right? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is within you. You're bought with a price, therefore you're not your own. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Our life belongs to Him. It comes from Him, and it returns to Him. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. God should determine those things. So, you're not property. No one is property. Not of Pharaoh, not by the government, and not by self. We belong to God. And therefore, God says, thou shalt not kill, and we must recognize His authority. Secondly, human life is not only belonging to God, human life is sacred. It is sacred because human life alone is made in the image and likeness of God. So God created the heaven and the earth and everything, and then He came in Genesis chapter 1 to verse 25, and He said, let us make man in our image. And God created man out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God did not have that level of intimacy, and and no other creation of God is made in the image and likeness of God. In fact, what's significant is this commandment specifically is related to His prohibition of murder back in Genesis chapter 9. God made, even before the Levitical law, God made the commandment. He said, "'Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he him.'" Why is it wrong to murder? Well, because I don't think it's a good thing to do. Well, because it's not, that's not civilized. There's a lot of things that people call civilized that are ungodly. No, it's because man is made in the image of God. And, and a, a murdering of an individual is taking something that doesn't belong to us, and it's doing violence to the image of God and man. By the way, as owner and protector of life and of sanctity of life, do you understand that God has assigned the highest punishment to those that do murder? So capital punishment is just. How, how do you know that, Pastor? Because God said it is. God protects the sanctity of human life with taking a life, and and He gave that to government. Romans chapter 13, take your Bible and flip over there. Romans chapter 13. God delegated that authority to government. It says, let every soul be subject, placed under the authority of, submissive, unto the higher powers. Why? Well, there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. All human authority is delegated authority from God. God allowed it to take place. Whoso therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance, direction, allowance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, judgment. For rulers are not a terror unto good works, but unto evil. Romans 13, verse 3. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. You don't want to be afraid of law enforcement in your rearview mirror. Drive the speed limit, right? You don't want to be afraid of police officers. Obey the law. That's not that difficult, right? Now, does that mean that Police officers don't have a sin nature and they never do anything wrong. No, we're not saying that. But you know what? If you obey the law, 
Nine times out of ten, you have nothing to worry about. It says, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee. Notice this. For if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he's a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You know what that means? You only use a sword for one thing, execution. The Bible is telling us right there that God delegates even capital punishment to government. In fact, we'll take it a step further. With the entrance of sin into the world, death is now a reality. By the way, did that come by man or by God? See, death entered the world by sin, and sin entered the world by by one man. For as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. The Bible says that, right? And so we understand that because sin is part of our reality, so is death. And the fruit of that original sin is violence, is evil, it's the threat of more death. And you have societies that are characterized, they deal in death. And so you know what God did? He ordered, he ordered war. Now, war is a horrible thing. Some people look at the war in the Bible and, you know, they say, how could God do that? Well, the violence, the witchcraft, the human sacrifice, the false religions, the war, the greed, the list goes on. And God said, you know what? Here's a way that you deal with that. I will judge the people that do that with war. God, the owner of life, the ultimate judge, the protector of life, will command genocide. And He did in Scripture, and sometimes Christians, we squirm when we see that. It's actual genocide. God said, wipe them out. Why? Because they were wicked, and by wiping them out, He prevented more death from taking place. Don't you know that God always knows what will prevent more death or cause more death? We can trust Him, right? Do you agree with that? Yes. Now, war is a terrible thing, but understand this, sin and death and the threat of it sometimes make it necessary. And so even in our time, sometimes war has to take place. So even if war is engaged in, if it's waged to protect life and prevent further death, it's not a violation of this commandment. So you say, Pastor, you can kill those who murder and you can be involved in war, yes, if it's according to the Word of God. This word right here, it it teaches us that. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. You'll run into people today, and you'll notice the hypocrisy. What's interesting is that our society, there are people out there, very loud voices, who would disagree with these things that I'm saying tonight. But you know what? Those people deny God's existence and therefore deny His ownership. So they, they don't recognize that God even exists. In the absence of God, do you realize that you're going to worship someone or something? And usually it's the person in the mirror or it's nature. We know where that goes. Not only would they deny the existence of God, but they deny man's place in creation. Those who say you shouldn't have capital punishment, you shouldn't do all these things, they deny man's place in creation, that we are created in the image of God. They'll have bumper stickers that say something like, all life is sacred. And I've often wanted to go to one of their house and see if they have bug spray underneath their sink, you know. Because if all life is sacred, you shouldn't even kill the roaches. The reality is that's an unhealthy, ungodly blurring of reality. Furthermore, they deny and and refute capital punishment. There's some countries where there is no capital punishment. You can do the worst crimes, and the state has to pay to keep you alive for the rest of your life. Now, friend, that's not biblical. You do understand that, right? That viewpoint. These same people, though, have a morality driven... Say, Pastor, where do you come up with something like that? Well, friend, from your own heart. Well, I just think it's right. I just think it's wrong. Well, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of... Yeah, death. And what's ironic is those who don't believe in God and don't want to worship God and don't believe in capital punishment and don't believe that man is made in the image of God, they are lobbying for death these days in the name of compassion, actually violating this commandment. Uh, A week ago, I was driving down the road, and I saw a group of people with posters. They They were rallying to protect the right to kill unborn babies. And I bet if we had stopped, they would agree with these things that I've just said. I don't believe in God. I don't think that's real. I don't think... But they want to kill an unborn baby. Mercy killing. The euthanasia, 
Killing of the elderly or disabled, it's frequently proposed by those who claim to support a quality of life. And this takes the form of rationing health care, killing those who are terminally or mentally ill, ending the life of those who are disabled. And what's ironic, folks, is euthanasia and abortion go hand in hand. And you say, Pastor, what is driving that? How does that happen? Are those people evil? No, friend, but the Bible says that the Spirit right now works iniquity. It's the spirit of the world. It's the devil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, he says this, "'Year of your father the devil, the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it.'" So when you begin to see movements that are embracing lies, it's not much further down the road when they begin embracing murder. And you know what? It's departing from this right here. "'Thou shalt not kill.'" Human life is sacred. So God is teaching them this. Now, whether the people around them believed it or not, in Egypt they certainly didn't believe that human life was sacred. They worshipped all manner of animals. But man is set apart as different. Look at verse 14. Not just that, but he says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, God's design for marriage... Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I love to go back to the beginnings. Genesis, the book of the beginnings. Look at verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. How many of you are there now? Yeah, you're going to sleep? Okay. Don't be sleeping. And he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib there which the Lord had taken from man made a woman and brought her unto man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, a man with a womb, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed." Marriage, God's design, is a union between a man and a woman in the sight of God. By the way, that's the only union that's blessed by God. It's a complete union, body, soul, and spirit. It's a separate union. Leave father and mother, cleave unto wife, and it's a permanent union. In fact, Jesus said, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. That's God's plan. And the importance of the family union cannot be it really can't be overemphasized. See, uh, marriage is the first institution ordained by God. You do understand that, right? Before the church, before government, before anything else, marriage. Marriage produces offspring, new people introduced into the world. And God's plan, that was God's plan before the fall. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, He said, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He told them that before sin. That was what they were supposed to do. Married couples would need to train up their children in the truth and, and in God's Word and law for the next generation to do right. But you know what? Marriage has challenges. Those of you that are married for very long, you know that, right? There's challenges. Why is there challenges, Pastor? Well, it's two sinners getting married, right? Yeah. In fact, right after sin entered, that was one of the things God said. He said, you're going to have strife in your marriage he said, your desire shall be to your husband, he'll rule over you. That doesn't sound like a very you know, nice thing to tell the woman, right? By the way, you're going to have a little bit of strife there. You're going to have some ruling over you. Rule over me, you know? Yeah. And as a result of the fall, the raising of children would be difficult. You're not, you're not you know, teaching children to behave. You're teaching them not to misbehave. It's like the evangelization of the heathen. I have children. Genesis chapter 4, what happens? The Bible talks in glowing details about, you know, the first two children, Cain and Abel, and Adam knew his wife, and she had a child, and she had another child. And then by verse 8, one of them kills the other one. It's not going too well. And as a result of the fall, you know what? The flesh would desire intimacy outside of marriage. So you have all of these things. You know, Adam and Eve, they were drawn to sin because of lust. That you know what they had available to them? The Garden of Eden! Out of every tree of the garden, I must freely eat. But there was one tree they couldn't have, and that's what they wanted. And you know what? The flesh is just like that when it comes to lust, when it comes to intimacy. God says, hey, get married. There's intimacy. I bless it. The marriage bed is pure and undefiled, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. 
But you know what the flesh does? It seeks for that fulfillment outside in forbidden fruit. So God in His wisdom, you know what He did? He gave the Israelites this commandment. And it's very important, friends. Sometimes we look at our society and we think, well, you know, the world today, it's more evil than it's been in the past. I, I disagree. I think evil is more accessible these days. Um, sometimes it's more, uh, you, it's more anonymous these days. But do you understand that where they came from and where they were going, the worship of the gods of the people in Canaan was, was integral with immorality and prostitution. The worship of their gods, their temples. And we think that's horrible. It's horrible. And God says, you are not to partake in that. You know, the people of the land, if you want to know how morally bankrupt they were, um, Sodom and Gomorrah is a good example. It was back in the land where they were headed. So God's saying this, intimacy within marriage is a gift from God. But outside of marriage, you know what it does? It becomes a dishonor and a shame to the individual. Now, we've lost a lot in the area of shame these days. People will, will do wrong and they have no shame about it. But do you really realize that the, the culture of promiscuity today has dishonored the act of intimacy and dishonors the image of God and man? Do you think that's an accident or maybe that we're created in the image of God and the devil is wanting to attack God himself again? Yeah, it's tied. In fact, take your Bible and turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Say, Pastor, you keep turning to the New Testament. We're in the book of Exodus. Well, you do know they're in the same Bible. I don't want you to ever get the idea that they're disconnected because it's the same God. In fact, in the Old Testament, the truth is there. In the New Testament, the truth is a commentary on that truth. Man is made in the image of God. And if the adversary can dishonor mankind, he's attacking God himself. Look at verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Sounds like America. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Excuse me. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. God just said, don't make any graven images, don't worship them. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own bodies to, what's the next word? Dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know, people look at the sexual revolution, they look at all those things as if we are a more advanced society because we do these things without shame. Can I tell you that is a perversion and a dishonoring of what God intended? Nothing good has come of that. Nothing good has come of that. It is dishonoring. What God intended for good, man intended for evil. Continue reading there if you would. It says, Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. We see a lot of those today, things that I can't mention from the pulpit. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's not natural to want to uh, kill a child on the inside of the womb. And I, 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 I believe that the abortion industry capitalizes and, and takes advantage of women. It's a horrible thing. And many of them are victims as well. I mean, you might disagree with me, but that's okay. They need help. They don't need us to be evil towards them. It's a, it's a terrible thing in society. Likewise, also the men, leaving the nature of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. We see all manner of consequences from this. And you know what, friends? When society throws away God's definition of sexuality and morality... You know what they're throwing away? They're throwing away God's safeguards. And you know what's on the very next side of the door? Judgment. Look at verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know what that means? It means that, and I, I, I believe that 
Um, no one's born an atheist. If you meet somebody who's an atheist, they made that choice at some point in their life. We're made with a God awareness. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to retain him in their knowledge. They have to convince themselves. God gave them over. You want to run from me? He gives them over to a reprobate mind, a broken moral compass, unable to understand what is right or wrong, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled. And in this next verse, there's many different things that, that results from reprobate mind. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. None of these things are good. This is not an evolved society. This is downhill spiral when you reject the truth of God. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. We see this in society. Where did it start? It starts when people want to throw off these things that God designed us with, and I want to do it my own way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do them, but have pleasure in them that do them, running headlong toward judgment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And by the way, you know what? God dealt with adultery in a certain way. Those who, those who broke this law, it's not as if people were running around breaking this law and getting away with it. If you committed adultery, according to God, the Bible says you should be killed. It was one of the capital offenses. How much does God want to protect marriage, Pastor? I'd say He's pretty serious about it, wouldn't you? I'd say we should be serious about it, wouldn't you? Amen. The man that committeth adultery with another's man's wife... Even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and adulteress shall even be put to death. And you know what we do in America? We commercialize adultery. The pornography industry and removing, removing, you know, all manner of guilt and shame and rewriting things and renaming marriage. God's word is true. These laws that God has given, I said this, and as we draw to a close, we'll say it again. When God gives us rules, it's not to steal our joy. It is to protect us. And there is great liberation and freedom and joy within obeying the Lord. There is joy in serving Jesus, not self. Right. You know, very quickly, Jesus actually emphasized both of these. He was quoting from both of these commandments in the New Testament. And he said, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, that if you're angry with a brother without a cause, if you call a brother a fool, he said, you're in danger. In fact, God said he cared about your relationship with your brother so much that if there was something between you and another Christian, he said, if you're going to put an offering, I'll put it in your terms tonight. You're about to put an offering in that plate back there. God says, I don't even want your offering until you make it right with that brother. Because God wants obedience more than sacrifice, to be right with others. How did he feel about adultery? Well, Jesus said, you've heard it said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say unto you, whoso looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, Christian, we need to take it a step further. Sometimes Christians will say, well, we're no longer under the law. That's right. Grace calls us to an even higher standard. So it's not just, let's not murder people, it's, you know what, you and I, we need to take it seriously to advocate for life, to love others, to advocate for good relationships, take it a step further. Not just don't commit adultery, it's, you know what, we need to advocate for faithfulness in marriage, to love our spouses, to build a good home, to honor the Lord, because that's what God's plan is. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for these truths. Been around for so long, timeless truths. But Lord, we see society today that disobeys them, and we can very clearly, very clearly see the penalty. A lot of ways where we're at today is because we've thrown this away. Help us, O God, as your people, to take your word, to take your name, and to live like you. Be with us during this invitation. In your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed? If God has spoken to your heart tonight, friend, talk to the Lord. Make a commitment. The Lord's spared you from going astray in one of these areas.
Praise Him for it. Glory to God. Let's talk to the Lord as the piano plays. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. I hope that's the case tonight. If it is, take care of it. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we'll confess them. Brother Keith, I'm glad you came tonight with your family. Thanks for coming, guys. Would you please close us in a word of prayer, after which you'll be dismissed.